Well, hello, smart, beautiful people. Own it. <laughs> it's, isn't this fun, being in a, a big pack of brilliant people focused on one fascinating thing together? Yes. It is. So before you, uh, though, go dive into the reason you came here and dive into the details of build, build packs and runtimes and pushing applications to the cloud, I just want to focus uh, for a moment with you on what it means and consider what it means to be a super focused, technical, solution seeking smarty pants. Because that's what we are. And I'm a different kind. I'm a mechanical engineer. So the kinds of um, challenges and solutions I work with are very different than yours. But the rest of the world kind of doesn't know that. They think of us as kind of the same thing. Like when they're out, when they're out, um, at happy hour talking about, I wish they talked about this at happy hour, this is what I imagine they talk about, talking about the possibility of running out of fossil fuels or the excitement that a friend of theirs with a spinal injury could maybe walk again, or how complex it is um, for an ER doctor to be able to pull up our medical records but not your ex-boyfriend to check out what kind of meds you're taking and tell all his friends. When they talk about that stuff, eventually one of them just says, well, they'll think of something. And they mean us. And I don't remember, I mean, maybe you guys were more emotionally mature at, oh, we need a slide of them jumping, of them stage diving into the, yeah, there you go. That, that's you. Um, maybe you guys were more mature when you chose your field of study and you knew that you were setting out to help humanity. I was not, I was not. I don't remember signing up to help anybody. I don't even remember um, being connected to other human beings after school. Because school, if you were like me, you spent a lot of time alone. Did you? It's okay. We're among friends now. That's why we're all here together. Because in first grade, this is what I remember about first grade in Anchorage, Alaska, where I went. Um, there were reading groups. Our teachers set up reading groups, and there were the zebras and the monkeys and the tigers. And I was super psyched because I loved animals, and any one of those was fine with me. I just couldn't wait to figure out what reading group I was in. And then I was sent back to my desk just to read on my own. I was pissed. Little six-year-old, little pigtails, just furious, sitting at my desk and looking at all the other reading groups. And they looked like they were having a fantastic time. Zebras were reading um, these little cautionary tales, really, about a fully dressed cat who's clearly a sociopath. And um, they looked like they were having a great time. And then the monkeys were reading short little vignettes about um, colors in fruit and the colors of fruit. Orange is orange, for example. Um, and then the tigers, from what I could tell, were just chewing the erasers off of their giant pencils and occasionally tackling each other and, and a little bloodletting. Um, but still, I want to, and if you were a tiger, don't be ashamed of that, because you were probably a math genius. Einstein was, would have been put in the tiger group. But it looked like every group was having more fun than me, and that I was somehow being punished. And it made me really sad, and I thought that maybe the, they had little codes on the playground, like a tiger would see another tiger from another class and be like, oh, got your back. Like, I don't know, because I don't, wasn't part of a group. Like, zebras, maybe they were like, Hey, but you weren't in a group either, so you don't know. Maybe they did that. I just remember feeling kind of disconnected, like I was being punished for something. And by second grade, or second through sixth grade, any time there was anything to do with reading or spelling or anything, I was sent to the library just to read on my own. Were you guys ever just sent to the corner to do your own thing? You were in the corner coding, second grade. I got this. And in the library, I kept myself busy. I read about um, Charlotte the Spider and um, H Hercules and Harriet Tubman, the heroes, and uh, Hitler, the asshole. Because even at 10 years old, I mean, you know, it's very clear. And I felt like, and this is why I didn't real feel very altruistic by the time I got out of school. I did, wasn't really interested in helping anybody. I mean, by the time I was in sixth grade, I had completely run out of material in the library. I was just trying to be helpful. I helped the, the librarian scrape gum off the bottom of the chairs, like I was in a little prison camp, making plans for what happened if things 
went bad in Anchorage, Alaska, because I, I knew too much by then. I'd even researched the atom bomb, scraping gum, thinking if it got really weird, I was going to pull all the tigers together and get them to protect me, because I'd also read Lord of the Flies by then. I knew how bad it could get. And I tell you this because I think being born like we were with a capacity to come up with solutions and to learn really quickly and to focus and to and need to satisfy our curiosity made us quick learners. Um, and that was sometimes a little lonely, but really it, it is a privilege. But it, I think it's a lot like being born into royalty. You don't choose it. You really don't choose to be smart and to be quick and to be focused. But once you're there, you kind of have an obligation. And it is, it is a privilege. And I know it doesn't feel like a privilege or it didn't feel like it then because we've all worked really hard to be where we are in our careers. Um, and, it, and it took um, a lot of concentration, a lot of study to do what we do. And face it, we survived the loneliness of grade school and the killing fields of the playground, running while the tigers chased you, their eraser breath hot on your neck. We survived all that. We've earned this. But, it's hard, it, but we, are, we are privileged, and, and we not only have this capacity to help the world and change the world and to innovate, but the rest of the world out there, the non-technical people, they believe that we'll do it unselfishly. They believe that we're just happy to help. And, and luckily, that is, that is mostly true, that we mostly are focused on the facts and focused on real solutions. But, it's a, but we still have a choice, really, to, uh, to face this, this expectation that our greater ability um, means that we owe something greater. It's a, um, we have a choice to really embrace this noblesse oblige. Yeah, I just said that. I said noblesse oblige because I'm in a whole room of smart people and I can use big words. I can use other languages as needed. Noblesse oblige, as you know, means the, the obligation of the nobility of those born into privilege to be protective and helpful to those not born into privilege. And I know that sounds a little bit snobby, um, a little bit um, classist in a way, but it's just us so we can talk about this. We're smart. And there are some people out there who are not as smart, and that's okay. We do have an obligation to use our ability to make the world better. And it took me a long time to grow into this, and I'm in my late 40s now, and it took me a, a, lo a lot of my career, I was just out to you know, have enough independence and enough money and to do what I wanted and be respected for my intelligence. And now I realize I've, I have these projects where people could really get hurt if I do it wrong. I have a project in Portland that I'm working on now with a bunch of great structural engineers and architects, real architects, you know. Um, on <laughs> uh, and it's a patient tower. It's a nine-story patient tower with a psychiatric lockdown and a NICU with these babies like the size of your hand with people who are going through um, chemotherapy and dialysis. It's this huge tower full of the most vulnerable people in my community, and I have to make sure it gets properly seismically upgraded, and that the air flows are changed so that we're not swapping infections from sick people to babies, that it's safe so that the people in lockdown who really can't get out in an emergency are still safe. And the team has to do it in a way so that if there is an emergency and people go streaming toward the hospital, that the hospital is still standing. This kind of freaks me out. And we're, really we're all in this together because um, 80 years ago, if there were a power outage, a prolonged power outage, um, light a few candles, you have a party, we're good. But now, between your pack of geniuses and my kind of engineers, we make sure that the power is on, that the water is running, that communications are up. And if things go bad, if, if we don't get this right, now they're really in a prolonged outage. There really could be and will be food riots. I know this because I hosted a TV show where all we did was look at worst-case scenarios. 
And if that happens, in fact, if there's an, a power outage for very long, since you are the, the solution people, the technical people, your friends and neighbors will come and find you. They'll come to your house and they'll expect you to like make a generator out of a stationary bike and a car battery and, and purify water from a wading pool and a bunch of saran wrap. Just because they expect you to have answers. And they also expect you to do it in a way that's very generous and, and doesn't turn you into like the warlord of Clover Court. They expect this of you. Can I get that next slide and see if you guys, do you know who this guy is? This is the super nerd of the world, Archimedes. And uh, he's the, this is his moment, his eureka moment in the bathtub when he understands buoyancy and then runs out in the street naked. Which in high school, the way I heard the story was blah, 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 naked guy in a bathtub, blah, 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 naked guy running through the street. But he's, he's the super nerd and, and we retell the story of his death because there's something kind of oddly sweet about it. His, um, because he's just <laughs> such a nerd, even to the moment of his death. And this is kind of what the world expects us to be, so above the fray. He's, Syracuse is being sacked by a Roman general, and the Roman general has said to his soldiers, bring this guy back alive, because he's an innovator, he's a smarty pants, he's very useful. And he's sitting there doing geometry or something in the sand, doing a new prototype for a water screw. And the uh, Roman soldier comes up and says, come with me. And Archimedes says, go away, I'm doing geometry. And the Roman soldier kills him. And there's something so oddly sweet about this story because he's so in love with innovation and, and knowledge and invention that he literally dies for it. Like he doesn't even bother to look up at this invading soldier. Or else it was just a giant misread of social cues, which we're also known for. Like, <laughs> you cannot get any more socially awkward than stay away from my geometry, armed soldier. Yeah, that didn't turn out well for him. But it's kind of sweet. That's how the rest of the world thinks of us, pure, sincere. And it's, it's kind of terrifying for me. Maybe you embraced it early, but I am coming to it late. It's a great responsibility. And by just showing up at Cloud Foundry Summit today, I can tell that you're committed to this, especially on the biggest hangover day of the year, right? Day after Mother's Day. <laughs> I know. Stay hydrated. Mom's home still, drinking Gatorade. Starts with like one mimosa at brunch. Oh, I guess I'll have a mimosa. Do you gonna no, have champagne? Okay. And then suddenly it's four in the morning. You guys are spray painting obscenities on the window of a Quiznos together. I know, matching mug shots every year. Do we need another set of mug shots in the family album? So you're here, obviously, because you're committed to sharing technology and self-policing and educating and training the next group coming up. And in some ways, obviously, you've internalized this oath of the innovator that I will code and build and design with the next coder, builder, designer in mind. I'll leave some breadcrumbs. I'll do it sensibly. I will put collective progress before individual recognition, which is funny that this group got it so right because it's something that, that governments and hippie communes have been going for since the beginning of mankind, and somehow you guys got it right. And mostly, the oath of the, interview, uh, the innovator is I will, just, I will be worthy of the world's trust. And that's a big one. It's like this guy. We don't really belong in the groups of zebras or monkeys or tigers. We are like freaky royal born unicorns, the geeky superheroes. Next slide, geeky superheroes. This is not to scale, by the way. Just I want you to know that I understand that. That's how, that's how superheroes look. See, these are the beautiful people because we're crucial. In fact, some of you have gotten a little bit more beautiful since you walked in. Did not expect the group to be this good looking, I, I got to tell you. But whatever we are, the world, the world believes in us completely and sincerely. They trust us. They know we will think of something. So do that. Go, think of something. Go, think of something. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>